In this video, we'll be discussing email and the protocols that make it work. Let's get started. Now we'll look at another very common network application, that is email. And like web, it has dedicated protocols that go with it. As you're all aware, the purpose of email is to transfer messages from one person to another. But involved in doing this is a complex system with a number of distinct components. We can break it down into the user agents, the mail servers, and the SMTP protocol, which is used to communicate both between the user agents and the mail servers and between mail servers. The user agent is the program that the user employs to retrieve their mail and read it, as well as to compose email and send them. It doesn't matter what system this runs on. It could be a smartphone or a desktop computer. All of the user agents have certain properties in common. User agents do not communicate directly with one another. They only communicate with the user's email server. Mail servers must be pre-configured with an account for each user. They then maintain a mailbox of messages waiting for that user to read. When the user's client or user agent connects to the server, it then retrieves messages from this mailbox. The mail server also maintains a queue of the messages that it needs to send out to other mail servers. The mail servers then use the SMTP protocol to transfer the messages. SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transport Protocol. Note that even though mail servers are functionally peers, as we described before, application processes operate in a client-server manner. So in this case, a mail server is always listening for connections, and when another mail server has messages to be sent, it acts as a client and connects to the receiving email server. The RFC for the email protocol specifies that it uses TCP, which provides reliability to the connection. The RFC also designates that port 25 will be used for SMTP. And as we look at this protocol, you may note that there are some similarities with HTTP. The commands are in ASCII text, so they're human readable, and it is a transactional protocol, meaning that the basic interaction consists of a request and a response. There are also a number of designated response codes that indicate success or failure of the request. One of the idiosyncrasies of email is that it uses 7-bit ASCII. So rather than providing for 256 characters, it only provides for 128, which means that when binary data is to be sent over email as an attachment, it must be translated into valid 7-bit ASCII values and then translated back on the receiving side. Let's look at an example of an email exchange. Alice is going to use her email client to compose a message to Bob, who is at another institution. When Alice sends the message, her client communicates with the server. Once her message is placed in the outgoing email queue on her email server, her server will look up the server for the remote institution and establish a connection to it. Once the TCP connection is open, then SMTP can be used to transfer the message. Bob's email server will look at the to field and recognize Bob's email address and put it in his mailbox. Later on, Bob can use his mail client to check his mailbox and retrieve the message. This is the basic interaction of mail servers and mail clients. Modern systems have many optimizations that have gone beyond this basic interaction. For example, the adoption of push notifications so that mail servers can notify the client when a message is ready. It's also the case that many people use a web-based mail client. The process is the same. However, the machine actually running the client is a web server instead of being the desktop in front of the user. Here is a sample exchange of the SMTP protocol. Let's have a look at it. Note that each line is designated S or C for server or client, so we're seeing both sides of the exchange. When the TCP connection is established, the server identifies itself with the code 220 and its domain name. The client then identifies itself with the hello message and its domain name. The server responds to this with the code 250, which means it is ready to accept email. The client then populates several fields for the email header, including the mail from, the recipient field, each of which are one-line directives and acknowledged individually by the server. The client then says it is going to send data, which will be a multi-line process. So you'll note that the server acknowledges the data directive and instructs that the client complete the data entry with a period on a line by itself. The client then transmits multiple lines for the body of the message, and these lines are not acknowledged individually by the server. After the line, with nothing but a period, the server acknowledges receipt of the entire data field, and the client could then begin a new email message, or it can close the connection. Just like with HTTP, you can try this out for yourself. Using Telnet, you can open a connection to an email server by specifying that Telnet connect to port 25 instead of the default Telnet port. All of the commands that we just talked about can be typed in or copied and pasted. 
you should be able to observe the corresponding acknowledgements from the server. Note that SMTP on port 25 is completely unencrypted, and because of security concerns with sending email unencrypted, it has become increasingly rare to find email servers with port 25 open and exposed to the internet. As we've mentioned a couple times, SMTP has some similarities to HTTP. One difference is that HTTP is focused on pulling information from the server to the client, whereas SMTP is focused on pushing data, meaning messages, from the client to the server. Both are ASCII-based and use command response interactions, but where HTTP is focused on retrieving a single object per interaction, SMTP is designed from the get-go with a multi-part structure. SMTP also has the oddity of only supporting 7-bit ASCII, which supports printable characters, but is an inherent limitation for transferring binary data. What we saw a couple slides ago were the commands recognized within the SMTP protocol. This is distinct from the formatting of the message itself that is sent in the data portion of the protocol. Within the data portion of the message, the to, from, and subject line, which we hadn't seen so far, are included in text. This is read by the receiving email client and displayed for the user. Note that there is nothing to ensure that the content of these fields is identical to the directives that were given to the server and the protocol in the mail from and receipt to commands. And this is what makes it relatively easy to trick users by showing spoofed email addresses. Additional services run either on the server or the client may do additional checking on the email body and flag such discrepancies as potentially malicious. We mentioned that SMTP is designed for pushing messages from the client to the server. So what happens when the client needs to retrieve messages from the server on the receiving side? Historically, the POP3 protocol was the most common, but it is becoming increasingly rare today. Many users, as mentioned, use HTTP to connect to the server, which runs the client for them. Or if the user is using a dedicated email client, such as Outlook or Mail, it may be using the IMAP protocol, which is more sophisticated than the POP3 protocol. With both HTTP and IMAP, the server maintains both the email messages and any directory structure of folders that's been configured by the user. This means that the user may connect from a variety of email clients, but the message structure on the server will remain the same. That completes our look at email. In the next video, we'll be discussing DNS, the domain name system. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell. Thank you.